Let's just start right back at the beginning. We'll try and do a bit of a timeline. Prior to Mangatawhiri Crossing, there had been an exchange between Kingi Tafio and Governor Gray. Are you able to share that story with us? Yes, yeah, so after Tafio became the king, Governor Gray made his way through to Ngaro Wahi and had a discussion with Tafio. Uh, and principally because of the relationship of Tafio uh, in his younger days and falling out with his father, he was exiled to Kawaii Island and to Governor Gray's house. Uh, and so they had a wonderful relationship. It wasn't until the establishment of really the Kingitanga that the uh, relationship between Governor Gray and the Kingitanga um, absolutely went south. And so they had that uh, discussion, there was the declaration uh, in Auckland, uh, and so Tafio said to him, look, uh, if you cross the Mangatawhiri, then I'll have to uh, be at war, because that's what the strong shoulders, all those those kuro, uh, the council of advisors to Tafio was, uh, was saying to him. And so uh, he had to uh, put a stake in the sand, really. Although he wanted to do the uh, passive uh, resistance uh, type situation. So Governor Gray came down. Uh, he came down to see Portito uh, before his death. Uh, and then he came down to see Tafio about putting the Kingitanga down or putting the Kingitanga aside uh, because uh, it was looked on as an uh, a frontal attack, really, on the monarchy of England. Uh, and as Governor Gray was the face of the monarchy of England, uh, you know, those sorts of uh, discussions ensued. So the kōrero was, if you cross the Mangatāwhiri, ka tū te pakanga ki rato waikato. But prior to that statement, there had been an ultimatum, really, wasn't there, about around the Kingitanga and about whether they ceded their so uh, ceded sovereignty, sovereignty to the Queen. Very much so. So our Fano and Tamaki especially, <coughs> were, uh, well, there was a declaration uh, that if they didn't uh, agree to the mana uh, of the Queen, then they had to move south of the Mangatawhiri and into the Waikato. And so some of them did. So uh, uh, there were significant hapu, uh, and actually there was sort of hedging of bets. So some people of the hapu came south, and some people stayed to look after the land interests. That declaration happened in 1863. All that while, though, they were creating the Great South Road to, to move troops south. So that was, it was sort of like a fait accompli that they were going to attack the Waikato. Uh, a number of people from Tamaki came south, a number of people uh, stayed to, uh, like, hedging their bets, uh, and then, um, uh, really, uh, war broke out. And so uh, the ones in Tāmaki actually stayed there to look after the Fedua, and that was really a, uh, a strategy on behalf of those hapu and on behalf of the Kingitanga. If we just jump back a little bit, I think one of the interesting things in researching this story and, and listening to some of the kai kōrero is this relationship that uh, Governor Gray had with Porta Tauti Fero Fero. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because he even gave his son to Governor Gray to look after. On his first tour of duty, so Governor Gray served two terms as governor. On his first tour of duty, the, the, uh, it wasn't about uh, creating the battles and things like that. So uh, Governor Gray came, he actually learnt to speak Māori, mm. he um, got on with a number of rangatira uh, from the north, from uh, all around really, uh, and he knew uh, how to create those relationships. And one of the strongest relationships really was with Porta Tau Te Whero Whero. So uh, in the 1840s, 1844, uh, Porta Tau uh, and Alfano and Tamaki uh, staged the big porphyry for Governor Fitzroy uh, in Rimuera. Uh, and and uh, it was a huge uh, affair. Later on, when Governor Gray came, uh, they had an awesome relationship. And actually, Governor Gray was a prolific writer, so there was a, wasn't a number of uh, writers at that time. And so Governor Gray actually recorded a lot of the mōtēatea, because Te Whero Whero was a mōtēatea man. And instead of giving you a yes or no answer, he would use a mōtēatea, and you would have to think about uh, what he was meaning in those sorts of uh, waiata. And so they had a wonderful relationship, actually, so much so that Governor Gray asked Te Whero Whero uh, to become the protectorate of Auckland. And so uh, Te Whero Whero lived at uh, the domain, 
uh, at uh, Pukekawa uh, and Pukekarua, uh, there at the domain. He lived at uh, Mangere and brought a number of uh, Ngāti Mahuta people to be trained uh, by the militia of the time as a protectorate of Auckland. There had been uh, sort of notions of people from the north, the south and the, and the east uh, that were wanting to uh, attack Auckland. Um, the, the trade routes were, were some of the strongest from uh, the interior of the Waikato, up the Waikato River, across to uh, the Manukau Harbour, uh, and then right into Auckland and Market Road and, uh, and selling their wares, their schooners would stay there. And that was all because of the relationship, really, between uh, those rangatira uh, and Governor Gray. So they had such a, such a relationship that when young Matutaira fell out with his father, he was shipped off to Cabo Island to learn some uh, diplomacy or... or uh, things like that, and he stayed there with Te Rauparaha's daughter. And so, you know, those just those relationships. Later on, when Te Rauparaha was in prison, uh, he was imprisoned on a boat in Auckland, uh, and Te Whiro Whiro asked, particularly petitioned Governor Gray, uh, to release him to his cottage at Pukekawa. Uh, and so uh, Te Rauparaha became under house arrest in Te Whiro Whiro's house because of that relationship with Governor Gray. Therefore, that discussion uh, between uh, Tafiao and Governor Gray over standing down Fakanoho Tikiingitanga, that must have been, with, with what we now know about the relationship, the kind of intergeneral re uh, relationship they had in their whanau, um, in both families, it must have been a pretty intense conversation. Can you share what, what was said? Where it really went sour was in the discussions between Governor Gray and Te Whiro Whiro, mm -hmm. when Governor Gray came down and he said, Tuku ato ki ngi tanga ki raro. And Te Whiro Whiro said, well, I can't, because it was actually uh, put up by all of the chiefs of the motu. Hey? And I don't, even I don't have the mana to, uh, to do that. And then Governor Gray says, oh, I'm going uh, to drink all of your water. I've got a cow that's going to drink all of your water and eat all of your foods. And then what will you eat? And Te Whiro Whiro, uh, ultimately said, I will eat you. And so from then on, there was no more discussions between Gray and Te Whiro Whiro. But Gray knew that he couldn't attack Te Whiro Whiro because the, the word of the motu was their bond. And ko te mana o te kupu, uh, ko te mana o te tangata. And so those ones that had supported Te Whiro Whiro to become the king, they would be honour bound uh, to come and support. And Gray really couldn't take on uh, the collective uh, Māori uh, of that time. And so it wasn't until after 1860 that Governor Gray started to devise the plans of, of uh, invading the Waikato because that uh, ultimately saw the death uh, of Te Whiro Whiro. And then when Tawhiao uh, became the king, uh, some of those honour-bound relationships weren't there uh, anymore. Uh, you know, they had passed away with Te Whiro Whiro. They, had, they said that they were only uh, trying to consolidate Māoridom for a time. Um, but there were a number of tri uh, tribes that were still uh, in support. And so Tafiao, uh, well, Matutaira uh, at the time, uh, became the king, and then Governor Gray came down, and he said the same thing to him. Tuku ato ki ngi tanga ki raro. But Matutaida uh, had a council of people that were there, um, you know, some of them were born before, before the 1800s, you know, they were, they were born in, in the old ways and they, uh, and they were really um, uh, tried to repulse the uh, influence of Governor Gray uh, over Tafiao and over the people. That was the definitive moment, you know, ki tanga ki raro. That's when the kōrero came about that actually you have to pledge allegiance to Queen Victoria. And so this was the second tour of duty of Governor Gray. And he said, you have to pledge allegiance to Queen Victoria. Uh, and, and they said, kao, ko te mana o te kīngi, me te mana o te kūini, herite. And so uh, that became uh, the point in time uh, where the declaration for the people around in Tāmaki, uh, Ihumatao, uh, or the whole uh, of, the t of the area of Tāmaki, if you don't pledge your allegiance, then uh, bugger off into the Waikato. Bugger off south of the uh, Mangatawhiri and into the Waikato. And that challenge, you know, if you cross the Mangatawhiri, then you, you know, we'll take it that you're at war with the Waikato. Was there any warning or lead up to, to that crossing? Oh, definitely. So the construction of the Great South Road was one of the biggest warnings. And 
actually there were peoples that were still moving uh, in and out of tamaki and in and out of the waikato, selling their goods, their flax, their wheat, their hara. Uh, and so they were bringing information back, and informa you know, so there was uh, information on both sides as well. There's an idea that there was a proclamation that was sent but may not have been received? As far as we knew, uh, there, was, there wasn't an official proclamation of a declaration of mm. war. Uh, it was simply that, um, you know, if you cross the Mangatawhiri, we will be at war, and then the troops showed up on the northern side of the Mangatawhiri and crossed the Mangatawhiri. It wasn't so much of a proclamation, but uh, viewed by the actions of, the, uh, of uh, General Cameron uh, and his troops. And what did it look like? How many men were there? Did people uh, perish? At Mangatawhiri? Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, so there were, um, uh, you know, the Kohe Kohe Ridge is, is up the top there, and they were just watching and waiting. As soon as they crossed, that's when the preparations began uh, at places like Rangiriri. Uh, there, there was uh, uh, those places at Mercer, and they, so they started preparing, Māori I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, started preparing for defensive. And their strategy was, it wasn't supposed to be the big battle at those places. It was supposed to be in a bottleneck sort of strategy because it was easier for them to draw them in and then uh, attack them from all sides. Well, Rangiriri was too open. And what they hadn't encountered uh, was the gunboats on the river before. Uh, I mean, they had done that at Te Kapa Moana at Miranda. And so some of those uh, of our Ngāti Pāua uh, and Ngāti Whanaunga relations came west uh, to support. Uh, but then they actually, so they tried to fell trees in the, in the river to try and stop it, but it was uh, too little uh, and not enough to be able to stop the boats. And then the cannons firing from the river, as well as the troops coming on the land, had never been encountered in the Waikato before. Yeah. Do you have an idea of what the, um, if there was the numbers on each side? So like I was saying, there was, there, it wasn't supposed to be the definitive mm. battle there, and so it was only uh, very small, and a lot of them were old, a lot of uh, women and children were mm. also there uh, trying to create the defences uh, and aspects there. And so uh, that caused Matataira, uh, Wiremu Tamihana and Dewi Maniapoto to leave the park, uh, actually, and go and get reinforcements. And so there was another 500-odd uh, uh, of Ngāti Haua uh, that were making their way through to Rangiriri, but the battle had, was already, uh, you know, in train. And so uh, there were far more uh, Pākehā uh, militia. And when I say Pākehā militia, I'm talking about others as well, like Kukutai and Te Whiaoro, uh, had uh, brought their people to fight alongside the Pākehā. And then the Kingi Tanga warriors were very few and far between, but the but the trenches were so and they were so high uh, that it was quite difficult for a lot of troops to get up them at the same time. So there were mitigating factors on each side. Before we go to Rangiriri, I just wanted to I don't want to uh, wash over the naming of Pokino and places like that. For um, Mamai talks about um, that those, you know, pōkeno as we know it is actually te pōkeno. And I wondered if you might be able to, to, to uh, talk to us about the oral history and the reasons why um, places had been named, you know, kia kore right. tatau wari wari, but what is the, what is the meaning of pōkeno? So actually the attack on Waikato started at the Pukekura, uh, the Pukekohe East Church. Uh, and they, so there was a little skirmish there. I think there was a, a couple of Māori that died and one of the Pākehā that died at the Pukekohe East Church, mm -hmm. and then they were making their way down. Because of those mate, uh, they called that place Pōkino. Yeah, the, uh, Pōkino. Uh, but then uh, when they wrote an E, they wrote it as an E. So now in today's um, uh, orthographics, I suppose, it's called Pōkino. Uh, but uh, but that's because the E was the E Māori mm -hmm. and the E Pākehā were, had the same uh, sort of uh, twang. And so uh, that came about because of that. There were there were a number of very, very small skirmishes, like uh, like uh, felling, the, felling the trees into the river and then, you know, shots were fired and, and someone would be uh, hurt and things like that. Well, that was encompassed in that name in Pōkino. Uh, in Pōkino. So Māori um, would have been getting ready because Rangiriri appears like it would have taken some time to prepare that pass site. Um, 
it's said to be the shape of a tuna. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, so the, the Rangiriri, mm. so the pa was actually designed, uh, it was way wider than uh, what we see uh, today, but the pa was designed by Te Wharepu, uh, who had been part and parcel in our kōrero at Rua Pika Pika, uh, up in the north, uh, and he saw the, the, the cannons of the Pākehā, uh, and so created the uh, trenches uh, to be able to... Uh, to absorb, I suppose, the impact of the cannons. But actually, uh, so it started from, um, you know, the Waikato, and then it went all the way into Kopuera, uh, and then into Lake Waikare. It encompassed almost the whole of the township of where Rangiriri stands now, or on the crest of the hill, anyway. Uh, and so uh, that was it. There was They were quite wide. Uh, and, uh, and they did it so that they could move easily around. So there wasn't just one sort of snake-like trench, there were a number. Eh? And, and that's how they viewed uh, Te Haere Te Tuna, eh? uh, especially the Tuna in the river. They just don't follow uh, one little current. They would uh, go into that hole or uh, there, and then the women and children will be uh, in, in parts of it, more lower down, whereas the men would be uh, up higher. And the women and children's job was to uh, put the powder uh, and the shot into the uh, musket, uh, pass it up, shoot, throw it down again, so, so it was a continuous cycle. Yeah. These recollections and letters and recordings about having to bring in these really high ladders, um, can you ex describe and explain that? Yeah, so the, especially the fronts of the, uh, of the trenches, so that you had the river uh, sort of on the, what's that side, the western sort of side of the Rangiriri trenches, and then you had the northern area, um, and that's where the uh, ground troops came. And so on those particular sides, it, there was a, a sloping hill, and so that's how they created their defences. And so when they got there, uh, they had to bring... They had bought their ladders, but they found that their ladders only come up to like three quarters of the way up the up the trench, and well, that's not good. Eh? So you know, you get there, you get stabbed with a bayonet and or shot with a musket, uh, uh, things like that. There were also those little gun holes in the uh, in the hills. Eh? So they were halfway up, boom, and so they had to they had to go back and they had to make extensions to their ladders uh, so that they could get all the way up to the top of the parapet. But from our uh, sort of history, uh, no one actually got right up the ladder and over uh, into the uh, trenches from the militia. It wasn't until, um, uh, you know, the battle sort of, uh, sort of stopped and the white flag went up uh, that they just come flooding into the marae, uh, into the uh, par site. Uh, but no one in the battle no one actually made it to the top of the ladders and over the parapets. Tell us about the white flag um, and the red flag uh, uh, that's contestable, that corridor. <laughs> yeah, so there was a bit of confusion. Hey, so uh, on the gunboats there was the, the red flag. Hey, and so the red flag meant uh, to the Māori, oh, because it was resoundingly noisy, and that, well, especially with the cannons off the gunboats and things like that. And so uh, they felt that the red flag meant war, eh? and that the white flag actually meant uh, peace. Or, or uh, well, there was a bit of confusion. They, uh, the night before uh, the end of the battle, there was a big uh, downpour, uh, and the gunpowder got wet. Eh? And so uh, my tupuna te ori ori, te rau, and uh, all of them decided, uh, actually, what are they going to do because their gunpowder was wet? So they decided they wanted to put up the white flag have a bit of, as a way of having a bit of a corded or a parley uh, with, the, um, with the colonial troops. And the idea was to put up the flag and then when the, when the uh, colonial troops come flooding into the pa, they would say, homai te pouta, homai te pouta. They wanted them to give them powder so that they could continue to fight. Eh? And so that was sort of like the... Uh, the psyche uh, of our tupuna at that time. Oh, no, 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 we're just experiencing a little, little bit of a problem, but once we get over that, we can get back to fighting. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't as if it was a surrender. It was the white flag in particular was uh, supposed to be a pause. So they would bring down the red flag to say, uh, you know, when the red flag was up, it was about uh, having a big old fight. When the white flag went up, it was about 
uh, hang on, let's have a pause, let's have a kōrero, you give us some powder, and then we can continue to fight. No, well, well, the uh, the uh, colonials didn't see it that way. They saw the white flag and they thought, oh, these guys have surrendered. Hey, awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey. Which must have been a bit of a surprise to them because they had um, some real problems with their regiments and in getting into the pass site. Do you think they took that opportunity? Oh, very much so. Oh, very much so. If someone, if someone even gave a hint of them surrendering, they're going to flood in and then they're going to, you know, and... Um, you know, uh, they, they took the opportunity with both hands, I think, because they knew uh, it was very difficult them, for them to infiltrate the park uh, uh, in a full frontal attack. Uh, so, yeah, I think they took the opportunity with both hands. What was the consequences of that um, failed surrender, if you like, or that, you know, of the white flag going up? Well, in the, in the Pākehā view, it was that Langirili had fallen. And so, um, but actually there were a number of men that just left. Eh? There were a number that were incarcerated as well, eh? especially those that had been um, infirmed or shot or my tūpuna tiori went out and actually pulled a Pākehā into a hollow so that he wouldn't get shot by friendly fire or by, and he got shot in the ankle and so uh, he actually had to stay, like he couldn't uh, escape. And one of the consequences was the woman and the children were ordered to leave, uh, and they were ordered to leave through the trenches and into Lake Kōpuera and across into Waikare uh, and escape around uh, and back into the Waikato. Uh, but the, the colonial troops at that time had reached the uh, crest of the hill overlooking the lake and started shooting them in the water. And so it was a very, very traumatic and trying time. Mm. They didn't surrender, but you know the co colonial soldiers took it as it was a surrender, and they had won. And had you heard? I mean, have we heard about this before? Um, I mean, because there are some rules in war, but in terms of killing of women and children, is that something that had been happening in the wars? Very much so. So, uh, really, in the Pakeha way of doing it, there were no women and children in their camp. Mm. No, there were. Uh, but for Māori, it was the uh, protection uh, of their domains. And, and that's not just a male thing, that's a female thing, that's a tamariki thing, that's a kaumatua thing. It's all parts of the community that look after the domain of the community. Uh, and I think that was one of the uh, first most tragic times that that, uh, that, that had happened. Uh, especially the uh, so they would they would uh, had children on their backs and uh, some of our some of the young mothers uh, in trying to escape across the uh, Lake Kopuera uh, and into Waikare and were being shot in the water and so uh, and so you know there's been a number of occasions throughout the generations where people have gone down there and the bones of small children uh, were still uh, prolific. So we have this situation where you know you've got Pākehā troops who have no families with them; they're just mostly fighting men, and then you've they're coming into contact with whole Fano that are fighting and defending their pass sites and things like that. And that probably is a theme that comes out later on down at Rangiau Fair and places like that. Where um, would it have been a surprise to them that there were so many women and children amongst the? I'm not sure because there was intelligence coming in and out of that path, mm. and so uh, one of the things was an enemy is an enemy is an enemy, eh? and um, you know uh, even a young child or a female holding a gun is still uh, a big threat. The other thing about the fall of Rangiriri was when the gunpowder got wet and the um, the ammunition of the of the pa had been compromised. By the time they, they got in, they were the only ones with guns. Eh? And so it wasn't as if they could sort of do a resurgence uh, with the patu versus the musket or something like that. Mm. It was about, um, you know, these tamariki, these wahine, these men, these kaumatua, uh, all uh, trying to navigate a pause so that they could possibly dry out their gunpowder or get some more uh, to continue to fight. 
some hapu left. Um, you know, as you said, women and children were killed and other people. Tell us about those who were um, incarcerated. There were a number that were incarcerated. They were, they were taken through to Auckland. And I'm talking men, women and children uh, that were taken through to Auckland. Uh, they were initially incarcerated on a boat in the Auckland Harbour, the Marion. But then there was a lot of sickness there. So they had to do something. And one of the, one of the things that we uh, know is that there was a woman on, that was incarcerated from drug unity called Hariata. Uh, and she uh, gave a lot of the waiatas to the people that could write at the time. And so there was a lot of reference about mm. those waiata. That's how we know that there were women and, uh, uh, and men uh, that were incarcerated uh, on the boat. Uh, in Tamaki, they decided that they were having, they were going to have a bar of it. So uh, the sickness was becoming rife. They needed to get off, and so they got off and they escaped to Cabo Island. Okay. And they escaped to Cabo Island, uh, and there were a number uh, of uh, Maori that were commissioned to go and ask them to return. Okay. And from there, they made it to the homeland. Uh, made it to the uh, big island, you know, with Ngāti Manuhiri uh, and uh, Ngāti Wai, uh, Te Kawerauā Maki, uh, and that's reflected in um, Te Kotahiro Eka. Uh, 100 acres was given uh, because of those tupuna uh, that were there, and then they made their way home down the uh, western, uh, western coast, crossing the Manukau, uh, and then back into the Waikato. Was it years later or months or...? Do you know how long it was? Did they ever come back to, to the to the fight, or was it way past then? Some of them did, but it was it really took them uh, a number of years. So 1863 uh, was Rangi in November, uh, and then by the time Te Ori Ori and them got back, it wasn't until the end of 65, um, and then a lot of them, uh, because of those sicknesses there, uh, uh, passed away. Uh, Wiremu Tamihana and Te Ori Ori dying in 66. Mm. Tell us about Wiremu Tamihana. He seems to be just woven through all the stories. He was a very high profile character, I suppose, uh, before and during uh, the establishment of the Kingitanga. So when Matere Te Fifi and co were coming up for Motaki and interviewing uh, various ones, they got to a point back in uh, Tuwharetua uh, when they asked to have her for a second time uh, and got a, a decline. That's where they gave up. But uh, Wiremu Tamihana could see uh, the uh, the vision of nationhood, I suppose, uh, that was uh, coming up. And around that time too, Wiremu Tamihana had gone to Auckland to seek a, 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 an interview with the governor of the time, uh, and he was left in the waiting room. Uh, for uh, more than a day, eh? and then by the t and he kept asking to see the governor because they had a sort of gentleman's arrangement that they would be able to uh, have access to uh, the rangatira of the Pākehā. And when he, when the uh, one of the uh, clerks uh, said, "Oh, you have to call through my legs," uh, that was when he knew, you know, the writings on the wall. You know, they, they, these guys, uh, they don't even want a relationship anymore. And so he left in disgust uh, and sort of uh, turned his mind to the establishment of the Kingitanga as a form of nationhood for Māori. And so he took up the challenge from there on, principally uh, supporting Te Whero Whero, uh, as the king. Um, prior to all of that happening, Wera Mutamehana uh, and his people had killed the grand-aunt of Te Whero Whero. And he knew that Te Whero Whero, uh, if he was be to become the king, he wouldn't be able to extract revenge uh, because he would have to put all of those things down. And so, uh, Wera Mutamihana at Pukawa uh, uh, nominated again Te Whero Whero. And when Te Whero Whero said, uh, they talked about the sun rising again in the morning. Okay. And so he said, oh, now I've got to come back to my whanau, especially of Ngāti Maniaputo, uh, to ask uh, for support. He went to, Te Whero Whero went to Te Ako, uh, to his uncles there. He came to Ngāti Apakura at Ngāroto, and then uh, to uh, uh, um, 
just outside of in between Otoranga and Te Kuiti at Haurua uh, to ask uh, Ngāti Mani and Putu. All of them said, Tukua tō, tō raru raru ki raro. Mm -hmm. So these grand aunts unavenged death, they were encouraging to uh, leave it aside and to accept uh, the king and tenga. The support of Ngāti Mani and Putu was ultra important uh, to Te Whero Whero because the whole area from the Waikato and its rivers and mountains and then the food basket of Ngāti Mani uh, meant that he would be, if he was to do it, then he would he would require the support of all of his people. And, te, and um, Wiremu Tamihana, actually, Te Whero Whero was still a bit uh, uneasy about accepting it. And so they called a hui at Rangi Aofia. Uh, and prior to Te Whero Whero coming, because it used to be uh, Ngāti Kuroki, Ngāti Haua, Ngāti Rahui, Ngāti Hinetu all living together at Rangi Aofia, because that was really uh, a whenua haumako, it was like fertile uh, for growing a whole lot of things. Prior to Te Whero Whero coming, Wera Mutamihana brought his daughter to be married to a man from Ngāti Apakura, and because Te Whero Whero's grand-aunt was closely allied to Ngāti Apakura, that was looked on as um, clearing that raru, raru. When By the time Te Whero Whero come and Te Tapihana, the old tohunga, told Te Whero Whero about what had happened, he threw his hat on the ground and he, and he sort of agreed uh, that he would be uh, that he would accept the kingship because the debt had been paid and and that would have weighed on his mind uh, uh, all the time. And so uh, that was one of the first indications of Te Whero Whero agreeing to be uh, the king. And then moving back, there was a number of uh, different ceremonies and different uh, pieces of kōrero. All the while at Paitai, just outside of Rangiriri, there was a whole big kōrero with Te Awaitai and Kukutai saying, we don't think that you should accept the kingship. Then you had Te Heu Heu being a bit more forceful, and then you had Wiri Butamihana quoting scripture, like Deuteronomy, and you should establish a king that's one of your brethren, that's one of your whānau, you know, you shouldn't set a king uh, from uh, anywhere else in the world, they should be uh, homegrown in your land, mm. you know. Uh, that's me paraphrasing the Bible, mm. by the way. Uh, and so, yeah, Wiri Butamihana, uh, he could see things before they happened. He could see uh, that the, the the relationship was changing, changing so much that actually the Māori chieftains were being degraded uh, in their time. He could see that the winds of war were coming, but it wasn't until Rangi Aofia, or the battle at Hairini, that he said, actually, I now know, with this word of Mutamehana, I now know this is a battle for the whole of New Zealand. No. He thought, they were just coming to attack the Kingitanga. When he saw what they did at Rangiaufia, he knew, actually, these guys aren't going to stop. No. And so, uh, carrying on. And so from then on, he became uh, sort of more peaceful-like and adopted uh, the Bible and um, established places like Pedia uh, with its own courthouse, with its own schoolhouse, with its own um, uh, wheat uh, mill with its own, you know, uh, industry for the people. And so that's where he turned his attention to a more uh, whānau ora type uh, situation for the people of the time. I was going to ask you actually, is, uh, was he a fighter? Had he been part of, you know, um, the battles prior to Rangi Aofia? He was born into fighting. Wow. Eh? So he was the son of the great Te Waharoa. Uh, in Te Waharoa was a strategist, uh, warmonger uh, in his own time. And so in his early days, he was named Tarapipipi. Mm -hmm. And as Tarapipipi, he took fight in the inter-Māori battles at Maketsu, uh, in Rotorua, uh, in all of those places. And he actually became uh, a bit renowned uh, for them. And, and he himself said he was a kaitangata, a person that uh, had eaten uh, the flesh of man. Um, but later on, um, through influences, he became a very devout Christian. Uh, and um, uh, he was one of the first ones to put his patu on the ground uh, at Tamahere uh, to uh, concede, uh, I suppose. He wasn't, a, he wasn't an overly tall man. Uh, he had at least two or three wives um, you know, and a number of uh, children. Uh, yeah, and... 
but his uh, sense of vision was uh, was uh, just bloody awesome. And and then later on in the Taranaki conflicts, he went down there with Te Ori Ori and uh, Hotene and, and and others to try and settle things down because his eldest son had led uh, some of Ngati Haua uh, to fight in Taranaki, and he went down to try and. Uh, uh, create, I suppose, a negotiated peace uh, between uh, Governor Gore Brown uh, and uh, and uh, Wiremu uh, Kingi uh, and and the like uh, in Taranaki at that time. So he was a sort of a mediator. He was uh, he mediated some of the peace on the Kaimais between the uh, the colonials and Tauranga Moana. Um, there were a number of things. He was a, a, a as a Christian, he knew how to read and write, and so he wrote. Copious amounts of letters. Eh? Um, he was a family man too. At Peria uh, was a lot of his uh, Fano and you know gainfully employed in doing stuff, but but a very communist man as well. So it wasn't about your pay is the money for you. It was about uh, kai for the people, eh? and so he was all about. Um, Building, I suppose, the nationhood within Ngati Haua, let alone uh, the Kingitanga uh, in general. So he would have had a great sense of what Rangiaufia, the, the food bowl of the Waikato, was was all about before um, it was invaded. And I've read some of his letters, which have been shared in those books. Um, it seems to be that he was always one step ahead of of um, the war. Um, would that be right? Like, and then he he's really he he gets uh, upsets like an understatement. But um, when Rangiaufia happens, he writes some letters to the crown, like you know we had an agreement. Can you share some of the that preamble to um, Waiari, Haerini, and Rangiaufia? His communication with the crown. Yeah, very much so. So so it actually started pre. Uh, or you know, just after the king, he would write letters and, and try to send letters even to England uh, to say to them, "Look, we're not we're not establishing this as a threat to you guys. Hey, eh? we we think that the ki the Maori king is one side of the house and the Pākehā queen is one the other side of the house, and the Tahuhu is God Almighty, and we all shelter uh, under the you know." Uh, so he was a he was a sort of a passive guy. He didn't want the war. He didn't want the war in the Waikato. But after his experience with the governor and then uh, the crossing of the Mangatafiri, so he was one of those ones that were advocating for a peaceful negotiated outcome. But then you had some of the uh, hotter heads within uh, the King Itanga that were saying, no, let's just bowl them over and once we win, we're going to go and sack Auckland and uh, all of those sorts of things. Well, William Tamihana when they were when he was taking his people there was a there was a case where uh, Ngati Haua uh, were accused of uh, raiding some of the Pakeha uh, farmhouses uh, and uh, killing cattle and things like that Wiremu Tamihana went and he admonished his own people for for doing things that were ungentlemanly like uh, even in the uh, face of war and so the letters started really uh, before uh, the wars. He after Rangiriri, uh, they got together on uh, a particular island in the middle of the Waikato with other leaders, including Tafiao, and started sending letters. And so those letters were talking about, hey, how's about we sit down and we start talking about, but the agenda of the militia and the colonial agenda at that time had it been fulfilled. They wanted to get to Rangiaufia because that was the breadbasket that was providing kai for uh, trade uh, into uh, Australia, uh, into the Americas, and as far afield as London. And so keep coming along, as they kept coming along at Pāterangi, uh, Wira Mutamihana was there. Uh, Rangiaufia, Wira Mutamihana was there. Uh, at Haerini, Wiri Mutamihana was there. And after all of those letters were flying out, you know, flying out. After, though, uh, Rangiafi and Haerini, Wiri Mutamihana came back to Karapiro uh, and try, and because he thought that they might come down uh, the river. One of the snags, though, was that the uh, Karapiro uh, waterfall was too high and they couldn't like pick up their bloody gunboats and bring it up to the top to carry on. That, so, and that's why the last dam on the Waikato River 
is that Klaapiro. Eh? And so it was uh, a blockage, really, for, for that. So what he did uh, is on the hill above Klaapiro, he created another pa. He thought that they were going to be attacked, but by the time uh, Tuhua had come across and Kahungunu had come across and Lewi Maniaputu had established Orako, that was where the flow of the militia was uh, travelling. And, f and um, after Orako, uh, there were no other uh, sort of big battles. And so uh, uh, his uh, readout at Te Tiki o Te Hingarangi uh, became uh, a readout for the Pākehā. Uh, and, and then he crossed the river over to Peria and sort of sought to live in a bit more peaceful-like nation. What happened um, before Rangi Alfia? How did we get to Rangi Alfia? From Rangi Didi, they came up to Ngārua Wahia, but Ngārua Wahia had been abandoned by that time because they had seen the impacts of the gunboats eh? and it was going to be, um, uh, they didn't have really enough time to be able to do that. So they, so they moved more into the interior eh? um, as they come up and then they come up the Waipa and then they uh, came over to Waiari, which was really just a small uh, sort of settlement with a bit of a lake uh, and so they were, they were, Pago were having a bit of a cocoa there uh, and got shot by some of the modern. <laughs> you know, there was a couple of uh, deaths there. But all of the militia were making their way through to the Paterangi line. Okay? Because that was the big pa. That was the big pa. It was pretty, uh, you know, sound and impregnable. Uh, and it was far enough away from the river so that the gunboats didn't have an impact. As soon as Cameron got there and he saw uh, the structures, again, high trenches and parapets and things like that, and they would have to do so much more mahi uh, to be able to do this. Even General Cameron said, we're not even going to try to do this. Right? And that's where the Marmaduke Dixon and all of those took their guerrilla warfare away from there because they had heard about the sanctuary at Angiafia. Wiremu Tamihana and, and others of the time had tried to negotiate that. While we're fighting over here, you leave our people alone over here. Uh, but um, the consequences came uh, that they uh, took the guerrilla warfare around and into Rangiafia to entice the people from Paterangi to come out and it succeeded. So when they come out and they got to the um, Haerini Rise, that was when gunshots were really fired. Rangi Alfia was an invasion. Now it was a it was a devastation, uh, really, of um, old people, of females, of tamariki uh, that were ensconced there, uh, and they thought that they had the protection of, of the churches there. But it was, uh, you know, in the final analysis, it was actually some of the ministry uh, that was giving, like Wagner, uh, in, in giving those sorts of kōrero. One of those people that came over from Ngāti Rangi uh, was Kereo Petrao, and he was involved in Pāterangi, and his family were living at Rangi Alfia, Ka Mata so he followed Vaupna to Oportiki. You know, and so, uh, you know, e arohana ki ngā whanaunga o te whakatohia, because the, the, woods, the seeds of those wars over there, uh, a lot of them were actually... Um, uh, bought from uh, Rangi Alfia. Te mm. Had Was Rangi Alfia something completely different to what we'd seen prior to, you know, to what happened there? W did it even, w were even the colonial soldiers shocked by what had happened there? Very much so. So some of them even deserted uh, and were uh, court martialed, or uh, I think that's the term. Uh, Court martialed or, or, or put before a judge, some of them were actually um, deported uh, back uh, to South Africa uh, and to uh, England because they didn't agree uh, with what had happened. Firstly, at Kopuera, uh, and then Māori knew they would go to the eighth degree. And then, with the burning of the church at Rangi Alfia, that was. Um, they had struck up wonderful relationships with religions at the time. They felt there is nothing these guys, you know, there is no end that these guys won't go to for their purpose. And so it became uh, 
a real point in time that changed the mind shift of Māori. That was when mistrust with the religions came. Eh? Not notwithstanding the fact that the missionaries hadn't been all uh, nicey nicey and uh, hunky dory and all of those uh, sorts of things, but that was a that was a real point in time where a lot of the religions, uh, Maori, or well, especially uh, in Tainui, uh, came away from them. Was did we after that start to see hahi Maori? Very much so, and for Kapolo Maori. Okay. So prior to uh, that, everyone had their own sort of atua, you know, the atua riri, the atua kai, the atua, uh, all of those uh, aspects. Uh, but then, when the with the coming of the of religion uh, to Aotearoa, and especially to Fero Fero, uh, embracing religion, when he said, um, you know, toko te atua ko uena ko kai tangata ina nei toko te atua ko te matua nui o te rangi. Mm. Okay. That sort of um, told the people. Uh, at that time, and with, especially with the king Tanga being uh, raised up with the Bible, you know, not not a crown or, or, or things like that. It was actually the Bible and uh, being ordained with oil uh, was hugely uh, Christian influences uh, in the uh, processes and procedures of the king Tanga. And so, yeah, we we saw various um, palmier there. We saw. The resurgence of Tohunga in the Karakia and the Farewananga. We saw, uh, although those were already there, but we saw a resurgence of people coming away from Christianity and embracing those a bit more. And then ultimately uh, in the adoption of the Paimarire and the Tariao. Uh. Did what happened at Rangiaufia uh, set a real, real example for Orako? Did people come? Not really, because Orako was one of those uh, stopgap par sites like uh, like Mercer. Uh, it wasn't they were they weren't ever supposed to have their big fight there, eh? because it was swampy, it was too open, it was unfinished. Uh, but when too high come and they said we didn't carry our guns all this way. Uh, you know, to, to sit here uh, and have a court at all. They wanted to fight, and Rewi had to honour them because he, they had put out the karanga to come and support, and so they fought in an unfinished pa. They fought uh, a bit away from water. They fought with uh, minimal uh, ammunition. You know, all of, those, all of those things had a big waiting. And then with the swamps around, you know, all the... Uh, so the... Um, uh, colonial troops, they just had to sit on the drier, drier ground because it was so bloody hard to get through the swamps. And so, yeah, so Orako was starkly different. It was starkly different. It was supposed to be one of those stopgap ones and then they moved back closer to Otorohanga where the, where the hills come into an arrow uh, type thing so that they would camp on the top, have um, things in the, in the middle, draw the militia in, and then be able to... Uh, but it didn't uh, eventuate that way. They had got what they wanted. Rangi Alfia was definitive because that was the, that was the food bowl. Uh, that was providing uh, not only the Kingitanga troops, but actually all of the people. It was... So they would bring kai from Kafia, they would bring uh, kai from the river, and they would amalgamate around Rangi Alfia to do the more inland things like the taro and the uh, and then the wheat and then the, you know all those um, uh, market garden uh, type things. This was well before Pukekohe had taken off as a market garden sort of centre uh, within Tangi. Can you kind of tell us what happened at Orako? I mean there's been movies made about it. Pākehā remember it quite romantically and the rest of it but what is the version He Kōrero Tukuihua? There's a whole number of different versions and every family has their own ones, really. But uh, the uh, militia came. Uh, they, uh, and then Tūhoi had come over and Kahumunu. Uh, there were a number of the Tairawhiti expedition actually were making their way over to support as well. Uh, but uh, with the machinations of the Pikiao blockade uh, at Matata, uh, they, a lot of that uh, didn't come to uh, fruition. So... Um, by the time those other ibi had come, they were tired and they were weary. Uh, Ngāti Whare, uh, Ngāti Manawa uh, had all um, 
like hedge their bets. Some come, some stay. Um, Ngāti Kahumuna uh, had come up. Uh, two whare toa, uh, a whole number of two whare toa in Whanganui uh, had come up to support at Oraka. But, uh, yeah, so the version is, is that they came there and they were still digging their trenches by the time the militia came. Uh, and then they, uh, they decided that they were going to fight. And, and at the end of uh, May, and the beginning of April, and so uh, really it was a it wasn't really a battle. It was sort of like a siege. Uh, so the militia just stayed on the the drier pieces of ground because it was very very swampy all around the park, uh, uh, and then cut off their access to the river. So that cut off access to water, uh, and so uh, there were women uh, and children. Uh, in the pa, I mean, one of our crower remembers his grandmother was one of the ones running around, running through the trenches, filling up the powder and the shot um, uh, there as well. Uh, and then, really, uh, they they were starting to run out of ammunition, and it was sort of noticeable. And so the 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 Pākehā noticed that that was happening, and so they said to them, "Right, well, well, send out your woman and your children." Send them out and we won't harm or molest them. Eh? But the influences that had happened at Kopuera and Angiaufia meant that they didn't trust the word uh, of, the, uh, of the enemy. And so they refused. And actually it was a woman, it was a humaiti pairata, uh, that stood up, uh, Hitiri's daughter from um, Ngāti Tikohera and Tūwhare Toa, that stood up and said, no, if our men are to die, then we will die also. And then there's a bit of a debate about who said it, but it was either Ahumai or Rewi that said, and we will fight on forever and ever. They started, because the munitions had gone uh, right down, they started using peach pips uh, as their, uh, you know, in their muskets. Uh, very uh, ingenuitive in my view, uh, but they knew they couldn't last much longer, and so they had to make a break for it. And they had to make a break towards the river. So um, uh, they led uh, Lewi and them led the vanguard of the people to get to the river. And all the while, so they, they must have taken the uh, Pākehā by, uh, they must have got a shock or a surprise because they were quite close to the river before actually the, the, the Pākehā came out and they, oh shit, these fellows are escaping and started shooting them from behind. But a lot of them uh, got over uh, over the uh, Pūnu River, uh, and it was there really. Uh, well, sorry, it was sort of almost immediately after that that Tafiao came to some peaceful uh, discussions with um, uh, Cameron uh, and Co. and put his hat on the map. Well, when he put his hat on the map, the the brim of the hat was around the Pūnu River, and so. They were, um, they were sort of saved within Te Rohe Pōtai, within the king country. And what was the fate for the rest? Dead. I think a lot of them died. Very, very few of the Tūhoi contingent went home, uh, Te Whenua Nui and maybe a couple of others. And there's a, there's a ngeri, uh, that, uh, the pōwaru the that the um, a woman of Tūhoi performed to Te Whenua. Um, why did you come home? Why didn't you die with the rest of our husbands? Right. All those uh, sorts of really, really sad occasions. That, yeah, so there was a number of uh, dead uh, at Oraka. We, uh, I uh, particularly think that that was one of the, the most casualties that had fallen in the, in the wars uh, between Iwi and the crown of the time was all Aka. And so that's why it was a, a big thing. The other thing too was that there was no defeat because of the escape. And so that, that's where the glamour of Lewi's last stand and, and things come. And, and actually the influence of that, uh, that uh, was far and wide. So in the south was a uh, Pākehā woman uh, who was watching uh, 
or you know who had grown up with the stories about the the gallantry, the you know the virility, the strength, the um, things of Rewi Mania put on. So she named her nephew Rewi. Later on, he became Rewi Allen, who took part in uh, the Chinese revolt, and he became someone of uh, of note. His house is still a historical significant site in Beijing. You know, so the effects of the, or the 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 ripple effects of um, Orako uh, have been felt across the world. You mentioned there the um, the ngiri that the two hoi, um, women sing, and there's yeah. How does Waikato Tainui remember those how those how those um, uh, battles, those um, deaths being recorded in oral history? Yeah, so at the uh, Rewi's commemorative uh, park, mm -hmm. um, there are popo, popo, and uh, a number of those popo uh, were named after the Tuhoi uh, contingent. It has also been a point of whanaungatanga, between, uh, particularly between Tainui and Tuhoi, uh, right from uh, those times. I hoki mai ko e te whenua nui ki te aha. You know, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's just, and we have never ever forgotten uh, the sacrifice of those uh, awesome people. And actually, we think that it was in uh, haka in any, uh, the haka to do the invitation by Piripi Te Hewhew to the Fano and Watahuna uh, was um, Kotepuru, ooh, Kotepuru Koa. And when you ever you hear that in, in Tuho, it, it strikes a, a sense of comradeship eh? and, and those histories uh, between Tanui and, and Tuho. We remember them by, um, by talking about them all the time. Eh? Uh, we have uh, we, uh, Te Puea, and particularly in the times of Te Puea, uh, tried to uh, repay uh, with um, some of the um, settlement monies of the 1946 settlement that weren't accepted by the whānau too. Uh, it wasn't about moni mo te topo, eh? but the, and then those, um, uh, those relationships are such uh, that they have been fostered in, uh, right through to the current day. And through the names, so many people in Waikato and in, in the King Country are called Mamai or Mamai Ro. Um, they're a significant name, Mamai. Right throughout the battles, actually. Uh, so the naming of the children uh, is, you, you hear it especially at Rangi Alfia because. Uh, you know, they they tried to kick the hole in the wall, but the, by the time the the flames were engulfing the church, they could only create a small hole. So generally, only children could get out and hide in the swamp. And then those ones turned around and looked back. We had the keu, which is the trigger, um, the mamai, the pain, um, the pahuatanga, the the invasion, or you know, the Oh, yeah, there, there are heaps and heaps of names, mm. heaps and heaps of names there. Um, but right from Rangiriri, right through, they would name particular children about uh, after particular events that happened. The um, land confiscations of Waikato, um, you know, 1.3 million acres. Acres, acres, acres. Uh, how, uh, you know, following um, Orako, you know, what happened in the next gen in the next decades? What would life have been like for Waikato and people from Te Rohi Pōtai? Really, it was exile. Right? So, um, there were a number of that had stayed on their lands, but but those who were particularly the ones that had either. Um, not, uh, sorry, either fought with the Pākehā or not opposed uh, the Pākehā. And so there were a number that, that stayed, but the vast majority of the Kingitanga support had to get out and they had to move into the Nehe Nehe Nui. And it became a safe, ha uh, safe haven or a sanctuary uh, for anyone. Te Koti came, uh, 
there were a number uh, of uh, different ones that came to Tinehene Henry that had uh, prices on the head that came to the king country because it was a safe haven. It was like a sovereign nation, uh, actually, within New Zealand because it was the mana, not only of the king, but of the rangatira uh, of that time. And that extended out to Kapia, right down to Taumarunui and to Whanganui and, you know, parts of Tūwharetua. Uh, it, it was quite a vast uh, uh, sort of area. So it was exile, really, and uh, Pākehā tried to come and... Um, especially uh, Donald McLean and, and others of the minister, um, you know, so they were ministers within the um, uh, parliament. They had tried to come to make deals, you know, uh, things like that, but uh, the vast majority of those weren't uh, accepted. And it really, and so Tafiao uh, had a bit of a, a trek around Taranaki, and that really... Uh, that had a de uh, that had a defining sort of influence on on him, because of Tefiti and Tohu, because of Te Wahomene and the Paimari there, because of Titoko Waru and the strength, uh, and so they decided that they would follow a path of uh, rejuvenation of Mana Motuhake, uh, whether it be in communications, whether it be in finance, whether it be in land. So they set up a land league, they set up uh, their own. Uh, sort of uh, spiritual, um, uh, what you call it, like spiritual organisation. It wasn't so much of a hahi, uh, but more of a whakapono, you know, the play Māori did in its uh, beginning. And then they come back, and that's what Tafiao tried to set up uh, within um, the Nehe Nehe Nui. It took him 20 years, really, to move around his supporters and to really think about it, because... The, the confiscation of 1.2 million acres of land in the Waikato was devastating, yes, eh? because the land was where your home was, where your urupa was, where your tupuna lie, where you get your kai, all of those things. But actually it was the psychological damage that the Raupatu had, um, uh, had inflicted uh, on the Kingitanga and, and its people. And it took Tafiao a while to get the sort of mind shift out of the doldrums of the of the mind and into a place where they could actually discuss where are we trekking to from here. So the Raupatu became the single most devastating impact on the Kingitanga and Waikato, but it also became the single most rallying point for the psyche and the people of the Kingitanga um, uh, going forward. So the search, the search for redress uh, happened. Coming back... After uh, 1881, Tafiao laid his weapons down at Pirongia in front of uh, Gilbert Meir, uh, the then magistrate at the time, um, really bringing the Waikato chapter of the, of the wars to an end. It took until 1881 eh, uh, to, to be able to do that, and then he came back into the Waikato. Uh, after, after 84... When he went to England, 85, he came back and started to, to establish Manamotuhake pathways, including the Pokai, including a bank at Maungatautari, including his own communications through Te Hokioi, including his own parliament in Maungakama. You know, all of those um, uh, things uh, were coming about because of a Manamotuhake pathway. Was there a price to be paid for creating uh, Tenehi Nehi Nui? for the king country? Very much so. The price was inter-tribal squabbles. Eh? And so you had uh, different rangatira who had mana over their particular domains. They were they were supportive of the kingitanga, don't get me wrong, but they felt that they had the mana over their, their river, their kainga, their, you know, those uh, those things. Uh, and so they became, it became a little bit bitter uh, between uh, the Kingitanga uh, and the uh, local uh, mana, if you like. It also came about that um, the government were trying to divide and rule. Okay? So Tafiao had said, before he went to England, he said no to the railway. And he made it clear of his intentions. As soon as he was away, some of the Ngāti Mani and Putuchis agreed to the railway. But they had their own reasons for doing those things as well.
Okay? So they were, they were doing what they felt was important to look after the mana of their localities. And Parihaka had just happened, I guess, is in 18, 1881. So, yeah. Yeah. So the railways were. So so the decision, I guess, would have been with, with knowing what was happening down the road. Well, it's the same protagonists. Mm. Hey? So Bryce was down there. Bryce came to Kafia and started to threaten uh, the king to them. Hey? Uh, and then Gilbert Mayer, as the as the magistrate, came over and he said to uh, said to Tafio, uh, "We're going to we're just going to wipe you guys out." Hey? Tafio said to him, "Well, if your wave." If, if you're so strong, then your the wave of your sea will be able to get to the top of Pirongia. If it doesn't, we'll call you a Moana Kahakore, yeah, like like useless fella. Yeah. Moana Kahakore is still the Fari Nui at Rako Nui to this day to remember those kōrero. Yeah. Mm. And so the same protagonists that were in Taranaki and the Waikato, I don't know why, but there was all those connections between Waikato and Taranaki. Our kiwe o te kete that were that we fought together, we sat together. You know, we were, in our history, we weren't always the best of friends. We used to have intertribal wars with each other. But actually, in the coming of the Pākehā, that cemented a huge whanaungatanga down the west coast. Yeah. Following Orako and um, Waikato, you know, heading into the king country for protection, what happened to the land in Waikato? was confiscated. Uh, mm -hmm. So a number of the pockets of land were given uh, to the militia because what the, the colonial government at the time didn't have any money. And so the idea was to get troops from South Africa and out of India and England and, and other places, you know, other colonised places, bring them here. They didn't have any money, but it was the promise of land. So the higher your rank, the more land you got. And then you got... Uh, so if you were, I think it was, a captain and above, you got an acre in town. If you were uh, lower than a captain, then you got a, uh, a half acre. Uh, in and that's how they established townships. So almost, uh, almost the whole of Hamilton East was uh, militia people and, and people that were given those half acre uh, sorts of sections. Some of them were given quite vast stations. You know, they um, all around. You know, right, right from within the uh, Ropa to, and, that, and that's why uh, you know they were broken in by those people. But they couldn't pay them with money, so they paid them with land, and so that's where uh, those come. There were a number that the, you know the crown uh, kept control of, and they were petitioned to give them back to Maori, uh, and so what they did was they gave them to the friendly hapu. Never mind who was the rightful apu, they gave them they gave some of those pieces of land to friendly apu. What transpired though later on uh, is that because of the Falangatanga, those hapu uh, actually invited some of the original inhabitants of those areas to come back and stay with them. What is the consequence or the legacy of the war on the Waikato, do you think? The legacy of the war in the Waikato is about uh, establishing and entrenching a pathway of mana motuhake. It was devastating, yep, but it means to the people there is nothing we can't overcome. With the lessons of our tupuna that fought in those battles, their strategies, their visions, their creations, their... Uh, you know, when they, when they established banks and uh, mills and um, industry and um, churches and whakapono and all, all of those sorts of things, there's nothing we can't overcome in this generation. We might find it hard done by uh, because the government doesn't honour the Treaty of Waitangi or blah de blah de blah These guys actually had 1.2 million acres confiscated of the economy and they set a pathway for their tamariki and their mokopuna to be able to overcome uh, not only the workings of the time, but the psychological damage of the time. Of course, a lot of those things have lingered through the generations. I think, I think uh, that the state of our nation, as far as it relates to incarcerations, derives from those times and derives from the impacts uh, following those times. I mean, it's not just one, but it has been a gradual thing. The uh, 
uh, illiteracy, the uh, uh, mental health issues, I think that those are historical issues that haven't been addressed. So although in 1995 uh, we settled the Raupatu for the land, what we didn't do was settle those historical issues for, especially those historical social issues. Right? And so we're setting our mind to doing that um, coming up. Is it ironic when you look at those blocks of land where Rangiaufia and um, Orako are that in those same, in that same rohe is now a prison, you know, that houses so many of Waikato Māori and uh, Tokonui used to be there, which used to also be a place that lots of Māori were sent when they didn't know what to do with them. Is there, do you see a connection there? Very much so. I think that that was a, actually a strategic thing. So the other strategic thing was is that every pa within, uh, especially in Waikato, every pa that stood up to the colonial forces had a road put right through it. And it was supposed to break the back of the pa and devastate the psyche of the people from that part. Right. From Orako, you can almost see Waikiri, and it's going to be, you know, that's just got an influx, uh, you know, creating a bigger, it's actually a bigger industry than any other social enterprise in the area. Then the hospital at Tokanui, you know, just on that side of the Punyu, just to stamp that mark on that side of the Punya. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, I think that they were strategically placed. I think that there was more, more of an emotional uh, placement than there was of a practical. Um, because they put them there, and then they had to make the infrastructure. Right? And, and they're still doing it. So they've, they've put Waikiria and Tukunui in a place, and then they had to build a road to it. And then they had to set up a community to service those uh, sorts of things with their own infrastructure. But all of those came after the establishment of those places. So when the Crown put roads through your pa sites and your urupa and those, what have you been able to do as an iwi since then to rectify those situations? From Rangiriri, uh, in, in particular, and uh, our workings with NZTA, and they wanted to move the main road closer to the river where it is now, where the bypass and the double laning uh, sort of roads are now. One of our kaumatua, especially one of the kahuariki, uh, Tu Mate Mahuta, had a vision about filling in the old State Highway 1 to bring in back the modi of the pa. So we put that to NZTA, and that was one of the mitigation factors that happened to, uh, to do that. Like, the area has been karakiered for Africa, really, right, right throughout the generations, because there were bones, there were taonga, all uh, coming up. But the bloody main road was sitting there, right through uh, Rangiriri. Now that's been filled in. That, that particular site has been filled in. And it's the first time, in my, in my memory anyway, that you were actually able to get a shovel and fill in part of State Highway 1. And it, it may be symbolic or emotional, but it, was, it, it has gone a long way to be able to say, ah, ko hoki mai te mauri o te pā. What they hadn't encountered uh, was the gunboats on the river before. They actually, so they tried to fell trees in the, in the river to try and stop it, but it was uh, too little uh, and not enough to be able to stop the boats. And then the cannons firing from the river, as well as the troops coming on the land, had never been encountered in the Waikato before. 